Welcome to Illinois Family Spotlight, a conversation about faith, family, freedom, the state of Illinois, our nation, and conservative action. Here's David Smith and Monty Larrick. Thanks for making Illinois Family Spotlight part of your day. I'm Monty Larrick. Star Parker is the founder and president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, CURE. Ms. Parker, you've been meeting with pastors and faith leaders in Chicago who are trying to find solutions to the violence and poverty in Chicago. So to deal with these problems, we need more gun control, more (coughs) unconditional welfare, more broken homes, and more abortion. Well, not exactly. And in fact, uh, we met with the clergy who are center-right, who haven't bowed to the bills, who do not believe any of that rhetoric, and really want to find how do we get into the heart of the matter, at root of the problem, so that we can fix what's broken down. Uh, We know that it's particular communities with particular incidents uh, that are creating this environment to where people are now shooting at each other. Why we came in is because the legislature from this area of Chicago, west side of Chicago, actually asked he did it on national TV, we need help. So as a national uh, DC-based organization, we came in with one of our clergy council members uh, to see what we could do to help them assess where they should go from here. State Representative Sean Ford, he is encouraging help from the outside. Mayor Emanuel says we don't need it. Well, we're hoping that Mayor Emanuel then stays out of it because what we have found is the clergy that were here with us today and the community that was with us yesterday at the town hall do not want that same old rhetoric and response that they have been dealing with for the last 50 years, that liberal idea that people can't take care of themselves, that they can't make clear decisions for their own lives, so therefore they need heavy hand of government. He actually was not welcome, the mayor, into this discussion. Uh, the representative, LaShawn Ford, has been having an ongoing debate with the mayor in, here in Chicago for a long time, I found out, mostly because uh, the people are wondering why is it that you can gentrify communities but our community is still in ruin. Uh, and these are legitimate questions, so these are some of the things that we address, but also we address family breakdown because we know that this is at center of what some of this root is. The root cause of what we're seeing with these young boys shooting at each other is that they don't have dads. What we're seeing is all of that energy and no dad to direct it to uh, their studies or to sports or places where fathers get involved in their young men's lives. So they're going to the streets to express that energy and it's creating a lot of problem for a lot of other people. Well, is the church part of the solution? Is government part of the problem? And can government also be part of the solution? That's a really good question. The church is the absolute part of the solution. The government is part of the problem, and then the government has one component of solution. The scripture is clear. Render to Caesar what's Caesar's, to God what's God's, and charity belongs to the church. Charity belongs to the local community. Charity belongs to God. So what we have to do is sever what government has been doing that it shouldn't be doing, get the churches and the local community back involved. But there are things that government needs to do and can do. Government needs to deregulate. Government needs to stop excessive taxation. Government needs to stop controlling all of the educational environment and government needs to get out of the housing business. So there are things that we need government to do so that we can restore communities like Inglewood and or uh, West Chicago. But what about fatherless homes? Government through welfare programs, et cetera, kind of exacerbated the the problem. That's exactly right. Well, actually, they built the problem because prior to uh, the great welfare state, prior to Uncle Sam's uh, building his own plantation, uh, black family life was not in this disarray. In fact, it's underappreciated that up until those 60s, 78% of black husbands were in their homes with their wives raising their children. It is those very policies that broke the black family. So now we have to revisit that moment in history and see what we need to do to rebuild black family, meaning that we have to dismantle the welfare state. But also we have to start looking at the economic concerns, that we have to start building capacity for employment in these poor communities. And the way that you began that process is to stop the excessive taxation and regulation. Uh, when inside of our, our urban core has been a, I guess you could say, a playground for the left to experiment on different ideas, ideas of environmentalism. So you have all of these regulations so people, business won't even go in in some communities because it's just too aggressive for them to even try. So they board up their spots, so people that own the buildings in these neighborhoods, they board them up, they get a better tax advantage, leaving them empty, and it makes the whole community come to ruin. How is President Trump's tax reform plan helping inner cities? 
or is it? Oh, there are two places that it is absolutely helping. One a concept that I believe it was Ronald Reagan said trickle down works. It does. So when a business is healthy and doing well and the people are doing well, they start spending money and they start hiring people. So we're starting to see unemployment rates fall at record numbers, uh, even for uh, African Americans. The tax program that the president put in place is helping every American today, so including uh, black communities. And it also had a component in there that's really under uh, misinformation, and that is to stimulate inside of these uh, hard hit, or what we call distressed zip codes, he has some tax incentives um, in uh, through a um, the capital gains tax. If you locate in these communities, you're going to get some additional benefit uh, off of your tax burden. So there are components still being explored in the tax bill that passed last December to see how we can even more revitalize these communities. Uh, the other initiative that the president did is called an Opportunity Initiative, which has each department in Washington now exploring inside of their departments that have all of this welfare money, what is it doing and what, where can we collaborate it if possible? Where, where are they not benefiting at all and they need to be just even dismantled? So he gave the uh, each department head about 90 days to bring that assessment to him. Unfortunately, because the Democrats and Senate slowing things down, all of the departments are not fully staffed yet to get that work done in a timely manner. So I have a feeling that there, many of the departments will miss that deadline, and then, but the work is still to be done. Is that a way through tax reform to bring not just small business to the west side, the south side of Chicago, to Rockford, to Peoria, to the Quad Cities, to Springfield, but big business right. that provide living wages hundreds of jobs right. and mm -hmm. health care benefits yes absolutely in fact uh, the taxes are everything that's one of the reasons that he brought the cor corporate tax down remember the 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 tax bill that passed didn't only touch individuals lives it also touched corporate life and corporate life tax rate which was one of the highest in the world uh, came down to 21 percent what cure my organization was arguing for is that in our distressed zip codes bring it down to five percent now I didn't get that in but maybe the next go around but yes absolutely um, Nick uh, Nikki Haley, when she was the governor of South Carolina, built a model there. That's the reason that South Carolina started attracting so many businesses. Uh, she said, you want to come to my state? Here's your low corporate tax rate. You want to go into that zip code? Oh, it's even lower. And that's the reason that there's so much energy and so much economic stimulation in the most rural parts of South Carolina today. Why build in Mexico when you can build right here? Taxes. That's the reason that people build in Mexico instead of building right here. Is that a business? Money's fungible. Money's going to make more of itself. Money is like the same nature as mankind. It it creates, and if it can't create here, it's going to jump over there. So it uh, it jumped to Mexico so it can make more of itself. So if you want to build money and build profit in your in our own country and in our most distressed zip codes, then you bring the tax rate down. It's really that simple. This is Illinois Family Spotlight. We'll continue our conversation with Star Parker after this. Hello, I'm David Smith, Executive Director of the Illinois Family Institute, an independent nonprofit ministry dedicated to boldly bringing a biblical perspective to public policy. Here at IFI, our mission is to support traditional family values, defend biblical truths, and uphold Christian morals. We consider Mauk and Baker our allies in this mission, and we are proud to support them in their legal endeavors. Mauk and Baker is a law firm that upholds Christian beliefs, putting God first. If you ever find your religious liberty and rights as a person of faith under attack, you can trust the attorneys of Mauk and Baker to fight for you. Mauk and Baker has a team of Christian lawyers who seek to achieve justice and advance the gospel through their work. If you have a legal need or question and would like the perspective of a local Christian attorney, contact Mauk and Baker at 312-726-1243 or visit their website at maukbaker.com. This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. Could the transgender revolution really be fueled by a social dimension, a social contagion? That's what a current and now very controversial peer-reviewed study has found. The headline from The Economist in London was this. Why are so many teenage girls appearing in gender clinics? The author of the academic study discovered that there is a clear social dimension, a contagion of what's called gender dysphoria, particularly among adolescent girls and young women. So what does it mean? It means the recent spike in transgender identity may be attributable in large measure to the influence of other young women in the same place at the same time within a definable set of relationships or going to similar places on the Internet. 
You may have sensed this already by observation and intuition. Now, the academic research supports it. I'm Albert Mobley. Thanks once again for joining Illinois Family Spotlight. Monty Larry here, joined by Star Parker with Cure. Tell us about Cure. Star. Cure is a center for urban renewal and education. We are a think and do tank. We're a policy institute based in Washington, D.C., where we promote market based uh, solutions to fight poverty. So we have three programs. We have a policy center. In our policy center right now, we are consulting with the White House and with the Congress on ideas so that we can, um, you know, bring poverty rates down. Uh, we have a media center, which umbrella is Black Community News. Calm, so we can get the message out that the answer to poverty is is freedom. It's you know uh, faith. It's it's not a welfare state. Uh, and then we have a clergy um, program. And in our clergy center, we umbrella about 800 uh, pastors that serve in our hard hit communities across the country. So if people want to be part of the solution. How do they connect with the cure? Well, they would connect with us through urbancure.org. Uh, we're a nonprofit, so they can give to us uh, if they don't have you know, a way to help in other uh, places because that is how we support ourselves is through the benevolence of people, individuals who just want to make a difference in communities they might not uh, directly be able to impact. Uh, so it's urbancure.org, or they can just phone us, Cure. We're listed everywhere. We're all over the Internet, and so they can find Star Parker. You're going to find Cure. I Googled Star Parker and I got to you. Yeah, so. you got everything. Okay. <laughs> Ignore all the other stuff, okay? They probably had a lot of <laughs> My enemies know where I am, too, and they try to change my Wikipedia all the time, and they death threat me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. We were out on the, uh, uh, the southwest side of Chicago, right. and you had to have a bodyguard right. because of what you say. Right. Well, we, oh, yes, I had to go to a security expert uh, about, uh, well, this time last year. Uh, it was right after Steve Scalise had gotten shot. And so when you have that kind of tension of what's happening now with Antifa and Indivisible and Black Lives Matter, um, we know in D.C. that you need to secure in certain places. And myself personally began to take it much more seriously to travel with a guard sometimes, not all the time, uh, is because um, I compared the Confederate flag and the rainbow flag. So all the rainbow flag people, the LGBTQ community came after me. So I had to move out of my personal home. I had to go into all the security stuff. Um, and so coming into Chicago uh, was one of those instances that we, we we pray for the best but we prepare for the worst so we'd rather be safe than sorry and so yes one of our pastors uh, here in Chicago has his own security team and so he had them with me last night All right, well folks you're listening be praying for star and her safety <laughs> star you're a big advocate for education choice yeah. how do you sell that idea in the big blue state of Illinois with big teacher unions fighting that you know, it was fascinating to find how much school choice momentum there is in this state. In fact, Legislator Ford was telling me that uh, they just passed a school choice initiative. Uh, it's a scholarship program because you have a Blaine Amendment, but I think that after a while people grow tired of hearing the same story for why schools won't fix. And so when there's energy behind the market-based side of it to say, well, then why doesn't money just follow students to the schools the parents want, then you push against those unions. Uh, and people are starting to tire from hearing those same stories and then the bullies of the union stopping them from getting the best education for their children. Uh, the genie is out of the bottle when it comes to vouchers and school choice all across the country. The next step is just really to get rid of these Blaine amendments that are in the 39 states that make it so that it's unconstitutional to have school choice. The, the polling's on our side, parents are on our side, and now it's just the law that has to catch up, policy has to catch up uh, with the momentum that says, why is the government in the education business in the first place? If it's about educating other people people's children, uh, then allow the parent to decide where that child should be educated. So I think that even in a blue state like um, like Illinois, if we can do it in other states that were blue, we could do it here too. So I'm excited about the momentum of the pastors that actually wanted it and even legislators that are saying maybe this is a good idea. So what should pastors and uh, parents be telling their lawmakers? Well, the pastors should be building capacity, start and prepare themselves to open schools because the last thing you want is momentum and money moving with the children and no place for them to go. So that's the pastor's role. Consider, pray, should your church be a school? Do you have the building? Should you get 
a, a more understanding about putting a school there and hiring an administrator to carry that out. Uh, and it, it is a business, so they're getting all the training involved in that. And CURE actually can help uh, direct them to where that needs to, uh, that can be done. Um, the others that you said, the parents, what should they do? They should be putting pressure on, on their legislators to give them more opportunity. The challenge is not, though, in the legislature. The challenge is in the courts. Blaine is a constitutional. So you have to either get a case to the court to beat it out and or you're going to have to have that legislative fight to beat it out. They, they, your, your state just happens to be one that has that Blaine Amendment. The upside is there are two cases moving right now that will probably get back to the, get up to the Supreme Court and if they do, both of them could have the opportunity to get rid of all Blaines across the country and that means now school choice is a reality everywhere, not just in states like Indiana or, or Louisiana that don't have that Blaine. Well, if you're a parent whose kids are going to have to be in a public school, mm -hmm. what do you need to be doing to ensure that your kids are being properly educated and not indoctrinated? I don't know if there is anything that they can do anymore. The, the teachers' union are in control of those schools. Uh, they threaten the politicians to make sure that they don't change those curriculums. And I think that the only alternative to money following children to the school's parents want uh, is to pull your children out of those government schools. I'm just not sure that they're redeemable. Uh, when you have the head of the teachers' union who is a practicing lesbian, this is going to be her instruction. This is that 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 gender identity crisis that's in our midst uh, is real, and I'm just not sure that this is something that can be undone without competition. We've got to get to where the private sector is heavily competing against the public sector for these students to correct the public sector. Here in Illinois, the left wants to have uh, a new mandate for our public schools, K through 12, yeah. gay history. Right. And they'll bring in some experts to help right. teach the classes. Right. Bad idea. It's an absolutely bad idea, and it lends to what I just said. If a parent takes their child to the kindergarten, and they're talking to that child about what that mom and dad are doing when they go in the room and close the door and, and, and tell their children, stay in bed, uh, this is out of order. This is not space for the public to talk to other people's children about sexual matters. All sexual behavior is adult behavior. It should be very, very private. This is not place to do that in a kindergarten class to start talking about gay history. And the only way to stop them is to get the children out of those schools and have the churches compete with those schools to make sure that that, that student is getting the proper uh, education and consistent with that household. Uh, and that's why parental choice is so important. I personally do not believe that the government should be in the education business, no more than I think that if we're given food stamps, they should go in the grocery store business. But this is a process to dismantle that relationship, and the only way I think we can dismantle it is to get the private sector in the space that it should be. All right. Pro-life folks have long made the argument that abortion devalues life, but how do we make that argument to the public that says that leads to violence in the streets? I think that where the pro-life community made their mistake is when they began to call themselves pro-life. Abortion is a crime against humanity. We should not be doing it. So therefore, it is anti-abortion that we should be. Uh, when we expand it into pro-life, it waters down the mission. The mission is similar to the mission of the anti-slavery unit, the abolitionists. They didn't become pro-liberty. They stayed anti slavery because when you have a crime against humanity it really doesn't matter what people think uh, in their personal lives whether they think well we want to make sure we don't kill a, we, 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 that we kill off the next criminal well you could have killed off Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs had his mother been born 15 years later may have made that opportunity because she is uh, she, she was pregnant by uh, someone that wasn't her husband and so no, I, 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 I believe that this one is one that is very, very winnable if we didn't have so many people involved in planned policy when it comes to how we're going to rid ourselves of this horrible crime against the, you know, the, the humanity that God has placed in a, in a mother's womb. The, um, the, the, the slavery debate should be our model. We tried planned policy all through American's early history and we ended up in a civil war. I think we should learn from those mistakes, but I also think that instead of being pro-life, we should be anti-abortion. Well, here in Illinois, we have House Bill 40. This is legislation signed by a Republican governor that says uh, taxpayers have to fund 
elective abortions through all nine months of pregnancy. And the main recipients of this are women on Medicaid, primarily black women. Doesn't that say to these black women, you know, the state would be better off if you didn't have your kids because they're going to be a drain on society? It does send that message, but it also sends the message that, um, yeah, that yeah, you can't take care of these children. I, and frankly, I don't think that Illinois should have to be dipping and dabbing into the areas of how they're going to do abortion law. I think that abortion law is a crime against humanity as a nation, and all fights should be in uh, Washington, D.C. to stop this. Uh, you know, some say that, well, if we overturn Roe v. Wade, then we have the states to battle in. We did that, too, during slavery. I think that people that are in a pro-life movement should dust off the history books and look at the great debates that took place in the founding of this country when it came to the question of slavery. Because if we continue down this road that we are going, block granting it back to the states, let them each try to do it, then we're going to end up right back where we are. Uh, because some things you just shouldn't do, regardless of what majority opinion is. And this is one of them. It is a crime against humanity. God calls the growing in the womb his reward. And until we really understand that, uh, we, it's just not about planned policy. But I'm sorry that your state is now having to deal with that. My residency is in California. We've been there, done that, and it's not pretty because it is a deliberate attempt uh, of Margaret Sanger philosophy to make sure that certain people are not in existence because they just make sure, because they believe that these people are just not, one, human, but they also believe that they have nothing to contribute. I believe that everybody has something to contribute. And, you know, God it did not make any mistakes. Uh, we don't know what that purpose will be, but that their, their uh, set of circumstances that they're birthed into does not have to be their destiny. But death is certain. The midterm elections, a lot's at stake here, especially on the life issue, I would think, and for economic renewal in urban areas with tax reform, etc. It is huge. The momentum that has to make our country great again over the last 18 months cannot be stopped because the House is lost. This is a momentum, this is a national issue. This is not about the local congressman and whether somebody likes him or not. This is not about getting 100% of what you want or you're gonna take your Marlboros and go home. This is about international policy. If you like what you're seeing, Israel, we moved the embassy, I was there. If you like what you're seeing, we pushed ISIS back to where they're almost non-existent. If you like what you're seeing in international policy, where America is strong again in our vision and in our positioning. Uh, if you like what you're seeing in the economy, okay, let's move now to domestic policy. If you like the fact that we have people in charge of Washington, D.C. now that believe in a robust economy, they believe in the idea of capitalism. Profit is good. It's what's makes the engine for tomorrow so we can build the jobs that everybody says that they want. So if you like what's happening in investment, if you like what you're seeing in terms of unemployment rates go down, if you like what you're seeing in the courts, pro-life, you better want, your personal opinions aside, this is about a bigger agenda. This is about who we're going to be as a country. Are we going to be biblical and free? Or are we going to be secular and status? That's what's at stake. That's what was at stake in that last election. And that going into November, this is exactly what's at stake. And so for people that say, I'm not sure, I'm not energized, just keep in mind that we have courts that we must put people on that understand the principles of the Constitution, that understand the principles of, of, of capitalism, and that understand the principles of Christianity. Just a couple more, and I'll let you go. Okay, yeah. I could talk for hours no, with you, I Star. Can't. Well, we'll just you, do it again. Yeah, we'll do it again sometime. Here again, another Illinois issue, but it pertains to what's happening in the inner city and, or could happen to the inner city. They're talking about legalizing recreational marijuana in Illinois. Not Cheech and Chong marijuana, but this high-potency turbo marijuana. This can't be good for cities like Chicago, Rockford, Springfield, Peoria, et cetera. The clergy that were in this room over the last couple of days and that are energized to do the right thing by God and by their community ought to be engaged in this debate where they bring young men like the one that was on the panel last night and many others that are that they are trying that are trying to be good. You know, when we we talk often about the you know seven, eight hundred thousand African American boys and men, young men that are in prison. 
Very rarely do we say that 700 to 800,000 black young men are also in college. We, let's bring our, the strength of our youth into those hearing rooms and let's show them the picture of who they will destroy if they continue on this route to, to legalize marijuana. We know what's broken down. We know what's sick and everybody knows what's going to happen. Uh, we, and, and what's frankly, you know, irony is the people that are trying to promote this marijuana law are the very people that promote abortion law because they don't care. They don't care. They just they just want to, everything God said do, they don't want to, and everything God said don't do, that's what they want to do. But now what has to happen in Illinois for those that really are concerned about this uh, <laughs> agenda that is already sweeping other parts of our country, then they should strategically look at new players. And those new players are the pastors with the young men. They need to bring their nine-year-olds into that hearing room and let those legislators look out at black pastors with nine-year-old boys. Uh, and and, and that, then let's have the debate. Star, I saw in one of your brochures that you say that Chicago has a leadership deficit. We've had Democratic leaders for decades. Right. The scripture is clear that you have to have more than one voice. You know, everything sounds good until you bring the other. That's the reason that uh, we have organized our judicial system system according to scripture that you have to have two or three witnesses. What I meant by that is that the witness from the other side has not been at the table and that's what we were correcting here on this trip in Chicago. It's not that the leaders aren't here, they've just not been organized. And so CURE came in to allow them the opportunity to come together, meet each other and say, you know, the opposite side has been speaking for the last 50 years. Maybe it is our turn. Thanks again, Star Parker with CURE. If folks want to connect with your organization, your ministry, how can they do that? UrbanCure.org. Uh, we're a policy institute in Washington, D.C. But if you're concerned about Illinois, uh, then the partners that we are building here, we would like to get you more connected with them as well, including your uh, organization. All right, Illinois Family Institute. Thanks so much for joining us, Star Parker. A couple of notes. Before you vote, order copies of the Illinois Family Institute Voter Guide. The IFI Voter Guide is nonpartisan easy to use, and let you know where the candidates for office stand on life, the sanctity of marriage, taxes, and other key issues. To order the voter guide, call IFI at 708-781-9328. Tickets are available for the Illinois Family Institute Faith, Family, and Freedom Banquet with George Barna, one of the leading voices of Christianity today. The banquet is October 5th at the Stonegate and Hoffman Estates. For tickets, call 708-781-9328 or order online at IllinoisFamily.org. And please support the work of the Illinois Family Institute. All donations are tax deductible. Tell a friend about Illinois Family Spotlight. And until next time, God bless. Thank you for listening to Illinois Family Spotlight. For more information, please visit us at ifiaction.org and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. If you would like to email us questions or comments, please do so at feedback at ifiaction.org. Until next time, stay engaged and keep your eyes on the prize.